October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and to raise awareness, we have invited author Rachel Louise Snyder to speak. Praised by Masha Jessen of The New Yorker as a writer of uncommon talent and confidence, Ms. Snyder is the author of the deeply reported No Visible Bruises, What We Don't Know About Domestic Violence Can Kill Us, a careful investigation of the true scope of domestic violence revealing how the roots of America's most pressing social crisis are grounded in abuse happening behind closed doors. No Visible Bruises won the Hillman Prize and the New York Public Library Helen Bernstein Book Award and was chosen by the New York Times as one of the top 10 books of 2019. Welcome Ms. Snyder and thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here, joining you from out west, where it's been a busy, uh, busy October for me. Um, and Fairfax is kind of my backyard, so maybe one of these days I'll be able to come in person. But thank you all for coming on this Saturday morning. It's um, it's more important work than ever now. I really feel that. I think that uh, so much has changed about our world that um, our efforts have got to be double down in some ways. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of mash up my my background a bit uh, with um, some of the things I learned in writing No Visible Bruises. I really came through uh, the back door to domestic violence, to understanding domestic violence. I uh, I studied fiction, uh, you know, and, and nonfiction in grad school. I mean, I have, a, I have an MFA in creative writing. Uh, so it wasn't a natural, uh, you know, a natural move to go into journalism. Um, but after grad school, I uh, I was really interested in traveling and covering human rights stories. I mean, that was that was the thing that I thought I wanted to do with my life. And so I traveled all over doing stories like the forcible sterilization of Tibetan women um, by local governments or uh, Afghan women jailed in Kabul for most of them in there for love crimes. Uh, I did stories of child brides in multiple, multiple countries. <clears throat> I did stories uh, of women gang raped for sport. So there were a lot of these really intense, um, emotionally draining uh, stories that I covered. My voice is a little funny. It's a little earlier for me, for me here. Um, but, you know, in all of those stories, domestic violence sat at the core of the story. So were the child brides in Romania and India abused? Of course they were. But I, I was like, oh, but that's not my story, right? My story is on this young girl who's 13 getting married or, you know, the, the women in Niger who are cast out of their, their families for having fistulas, which is a story that I covered some years ago. Um, you know, of course they were all victims of domestic violence, but that wasn't my story. That's really how I, how I thought of it. I had this kind of separation in my head and, uh, it was, I mean, domestic violence was really like an abstraction to me, um, kind of a fleeting thought. And so I did, after grad school, I did a lot of traveling and, and covering of these stories. And at one point I moved, I, I was based in London for a couple of years. And then uh, from 2003 to 2006, I was based in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. And I covered, you know, uh, a lot of human rights uh, stories in Cambodia and in the sound, uh, surrounding region and uh, some war and natural disaster and, you know, whatever else was was happening. So in 2009, I left Cambodia and moved to Washington, D.C. And I was really worried that, like, the intensity of the stories I was going to cover was just not going to be the same in the U.S. Not that we didn't have problems, but that, like, there were lots of journalists already covering those problems. And where would I carve out some space for important stories and so I was standing on a friend's driveway in New England, someone we visit, I visit every year, and <clears throat> his sister drove up, and I recount this in the in the preface of the book. His sister drove up, it was a Saturday morning, and he, you know, he introduced us, nice to meet you, whatever, and I asked her what she did, and she said, oh, I run a domestic violence agency in town. 
And I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's yeah. I, I thought I actually thought I knew something about domestic violence. I was like, mm, yeah, domestic violence. That's, you know, and I remember saying to her, like, like, a, like a shelter, right. That was how limited my view was really. And she said, well, I mean, we have a shelter, but um, really what we do is look at the research and we've put together a program to try to predict domestic violence homicide before it happens in order to prevent it. And I, I really thought I had heard her wrong. Like, I really was like, I'm sorry, you do what now? We put together the highest risk indicators to try to predict domestic violence homicide in order to prevent it. It sounded absolutely impossible to me. You know, it wasn't just, I mean, you have any kind of a crime that involves a homicide, right? You have, I don't know, gang warfare or a robbery gone awry or whatever. Those are those are impossible to predict, but at least they often happen out in the open where you can stop them from happening. But domestic violence, I was like, how can that possibly be? And I ended up <laughs> sort of throwing myself at her in a kind of a funny way. I was like, I know it's a Saturday morning and you have a lot of errands to run, but please, can I go with you and learn more about this? I mean, I really was, I had a baby at the time and a dog were all there visiting. And I just left the baby and the dog with my husband was like, I will be back. I don't know when, but I'm going to follow this woman. And I drove, we drove around to grocery stores and <laughs> farmer's markets and all this stuff. And she really, she really humbled me that morning because I learned first of all, that what I knew could have fit on a post-it. I mean, here I was, this world-traveled feminist journalist author um, who knew nothing about this, nothing. So she kind of dismantled all these myths. Many of you, I'm sure, are aware of these myths, right? That if things were bad enough, victims would just leave or that the impetus to leave at all was on the victim. Um you know, that restraining orders and shelters were our solutions and that was how we fixed it. And it was all okay once you had a restraining order or got someone in shelter. Um, you know, that a violent relationship was uh, just a series of bad choices and bad luck. And I didn't, I, I didn't even realize I was buying into these myths. And this is, you know, it's, this is not a proud moment for me, but I tell this story because I think it is so important to remember how much I personally still have to learn in the world and how much I continue to learn. So she's giving me this education as we're driving around uh, Newburyport is where we were. And then she starts to tell me some of these risk indicators. She tells me that strangulation is different as a, as a risk factor um, than say a slap or a punch in terms of you know quantifiable dangerousness. She tells me that guns escalate the danger and it doesn't matter if the gun is owned by the victim or the perpetrator. So even a victim having a gun escalates the danger. She tells me that um, the beatings while pregnant uh, from an abuser are uh, a sign of increased um, dangerousness. Uh, and so she gives me this set of about 20 behaviors that can be calculated to try to predict any victims potential risk of homicide um and i'm not sure how many of you i mean i think maybe many of you work in in agencies so you know about the danger assessment already but for anybody out there in the world um these these 20 behaviors are available for you to look at uh on the dangerassessment.org i believe is the <clears throat> is the website is the link so she she really spends two or three hours that morning educating me. But for the next year, I mean, I realized quite quickly that I'm kind of out of my league in terms of not knowing anything about this. But the other thing I realize, and this is key, this was really key to no visible bruises, is that I am part of a system, the system of the media, that is also getting it wrong. And the reason I know that we're getting it wrong is that I got it wrong and I was primed to be one of the people in the media who would not get it wrong. I knew about the human rights abuses. I knew that domestic violence was in the background, right? So I am immediately like, I've got to write about this. I've got to do something about it. 
And for the next year, she gives me books to read. She tells me who to interview. You know, I, I start expanding my reach. Um, and I really, I learn so much about domestic violence. And I really learn what people like a lot of you are doing to, to try to address it. But the other thing I realized, and this is like sort of crazy, so stick with me here. The other thing I realized is that my ridiculous MFA degree, Masters of Fine Arts in Creative Writing, becomes the very thing that enables me to really understand domestic violence. And I'm going to illustrate this for you with a story from, from my book. But before I do, here's one quick thing about creative writing. When you're studying or teaching creative writing, you know, I, I teach at American University, very close by to where, where most of you are right now, I'm guessing. Um, and so when students come in my class for the first time, freshman students, young students, we talk a lot about plot, right? Because what happens is that they mistake event for plot. They think that like, you have a car blow up and then maybe a robbery and then, you know, some kidnapping. And that is your story, one event after another. And I have to teach them that plot is far more subtle than that. That plot is, in fact, a character being forced to make a decision between A and B. And because they choose B, they now have to make another decision between C and D. And because they choose C, they now have to make another. So in other words, it's not unrelated events. It is because they've done this, then this happens. Because they chose this, then this happens, right? And it's at the same time, an escalation in those decisions. So the stakes get higher and higher. Um, I just saw last night, Killers of the Flower Moon, fantastic movie for any of you who are looking for a good one, prepare yourselves. It is three and a half hours long, but it's a fantastic example of plot where the character, the main character, Leonardo DiCaprio is forever forced into moral decision-making. Do I stay with my uncle or do I go against him? And what happens if I go against him or stay with him? And it's this, this escalation. So that's a quick lesson on plot. And I'm going to illustrate this with a, with a story from my book. So Michelle Monson Mosier is 14 when she meets this really cute boy named Rocky and she falls for him instantly. He's like kind of small, he's muscly, he's high energy, he's cute. Um, he's also 10 years older than her. But as most 14 year olds, she thinks that she is mature enough for him and they start dating. Now her parents were divorced very amicably, lived a mile away from each other but they both worked full time. And so after school, Michelle would see Rocky and her parents didn't know. And one day her mother got off work early and drove past her ex-husband's house and saw a car parked outside. And she knew that her daughter was in there with whoever was driving that car. And she didn't want, you know, she didn't want to stray. She wanted to know who her daughter was hanging around. So she knocks on the door, nobody answers. She knocks again and she says, this is, I love her. She's so smart. She says, I know you're in there. And if you don't answer the door, I'm going to call the police. And so right away, you know, they, Michelle, her daughter flings open the door. What? Hi, mom. What? Huh? And there's a boy there. And he says, oh, I was just leaving. He's like shy and doesn't want to, you know, look her in the eye. And she says, I don't know who you are, but you have a car, which means you are too old to be hanging around with my 14 year old daughter. Oh, oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right. And he scurries off and he drives away. And of course, she thinks the problem is solved. But Michelle continues to see him behind everyone's back. And by 15, she finds out that she's pregnant. <clears throat> she lives with her mom. And her mom, at this point, her mom and dad find out how old Rocky is only after Michelle is pregnant, that he's 25 years old. And Michelle's mother wants to file statutory rape charges, but Michelle says, you do that and I will never, I will take off with Rocky and the baby and you'll never see me again. And so Michelle's mother does, I think, what any of us who are parents would do, which is it's better to keep them in our lives, right? So she doesn't file charges. Michelle gives birth to a little girl, Christy, 
uh, who's born two months early with like undeveloped lungs. So she spends uh, a month or so in the NICU and she's finally released. And Michelle takes the little baby home to her mother's house where she lives. And Rocky comes over every day. Sally, Michelle's mother says to me, like, I really have to give it to him. He came over every day. He was present. Um, And then she comes home. Sally comes home to a note from Michelle one day that says, Christy and Rocky and I deserve to be to try to be a family. We are moving in with Rocky. And so her 16 year old daughter and her grandchild move into a trailer on the outskirts of Billings, Montana, where Rocky lives. At 16, Chris, uh, Michelle gets pregnant again and she gives birth to a little boy named Kyle. Now, the thing about Michelle is she's amazing. She continues, she's living in a trailer, a one bedroom trailer park, two little kids under the age of three and a boyfriend. And she still goes to high school and graduates on time. I mean, that's that's really something. I couldn't even graduate on time when I went to high school and I didn't have any kids. So she's she graduates from high school and her father says, listen, you, a family of four, shouldn't be living in that little tiny trailer. I'm building a house on the outskirts of Billings. Once it's finished, you can move into my house in town. I'll rent it to you for, you know, under market rate. And that's what they do. So when she's 18, the four of them move to her dad's house and they rent it from her dad. Rocky, meanwhile, had been working on seismic crews when he and Michelle met. And they took him all over the state of Montana and he didn't like to be away from his family, he said. So he quit that job and he never worked full time again. He would do construction work, he would do roofing, but he never had a regular full time job again. So money is really tight and it's difficult. Now, we know that at this point they're living in the house. Michelle. Uh, is raising the two kids and he doesn't like her to have friends over because he says he thinks they're a bad influence on the kids and they take away her um, attention for the kids, right? So he couches this all like, I'm a really good father. I'm a very attentive father. But in fact, it is controlling Michelle. She's a little too young to quite know. So at 18 years old, she goes to him one day and says, look, money is really tight. Why don't I go apply for a job? They live right near a motel six. Why don't I see if they need some part-time work? I'll like clean rooms or something like that. I can walk to work. If the kids need me, I can be home right away. And his response to this is to feel completely emasculated. He starts screaming at her. Are you telling me I can't take care of my family? He gets so upset and so worked up that he lines the three of them up on the couch, the two little kids and Michelle, and he gets her grandfather's antique hunting rifle and he's marching back and forth like he's in the American Revolution yelling, like, don't tell me I'm not a good father. Don't tell me I'm not taking care of my kids and my, you know, my, my girlfriend. I'll kill you if you ever do this again. You don't need to work. It's my responsibility. And Michelle's like, never seen him like this. Like, this is sort of crazy behavior. And so she goes quiet to try to calm him down. And when he's calm, she calls his parents. They come over immediately. His dad says, son, what? you can't, you can't be doing this. What is, you can't, that's crazy. And Rocky says, oh my God, I know dad. I'm so embarrassed. I don't know why. I don't know what came over me. I, I'll never do it again. It's, this, this was crazy. And the interesting thing about that is that the message still got through to Michelle, right? There's this kind of shadow message that domestic violence victims tend to understand before the rest of us. And the message is this. Yes, Rocky has calmed down, but she still is left with the, the fact that Rocky is the one controlling everything. Rocky is the one who says, this is your job. This is my job. You don't work unless I say you work. And she gets it. And we know she gets it because she doesn't ever hold down a job. She never, ever holds down a job or even as far as anyone knows, offers to get one again. So she knows she can't work. Now she's 19. 
And she says to Rocky one day, listen, why don't I take some nursing classes at the school, Montana State University? And that way um, we won't have as much medical debt and it'll keep Kirsty, Christy and I in the home with Kyle. So in other words, she is starting to speak his language. She knows that he wants control over all of her movements, right? And when their daughter needs to be taken to the ER because she has, was born with undeveloped lungs, he's not in control of what happens there with Michelle, right? So she appeals to this level of control. Now we know that her plan is to get a nursing degree, but she doesn't tell him that. She couches it like, this will just help with the bills. They had all kinds of medical bills from Christie's care. And then she goes to her father. And this is how we know. She says to her father, I want to earn a nursing degree. I'm really not happy with Rocky. And I, I would like to figure out how to raise my kids without him someday. And her dad says, well, I've got an idea. Why don't we put the house in your name? I'll sell it to you for a dollar on a land contract. And then his name won't be on the deed. And when you need to get him out, when you need to you know, extricate yourself from him, the house will be yours. And they do this. And Rocky never finds out about this. And this is the thing to understand about domestic violence victims is that leaving is not a suitcase packed at the door like I'm going off to Vegas for the weekend, right? Leaving is often the, this, this kind of set of background maneuvers, very careful background shadowy maneuvers to try to get your freedom. And sometimes those maneuvers in the case of Michelle, certainly are years in the works. So one of the things I say is that so many of our systems are very formal systems like the judiciary or law enforcement are event-based systems, right? Like what happened on this day with these people? That's what they're concerned with. But domestic violence is a narrative system. This is how studying creative writing really began to enable me to see domestic violence. Domestic violence, if you're living it and experiencing it, is not event-based. It is a whole big, long narrative arc, as we would say. So she goes to Montana State University. They say, oh my God, your grades are great. We would love to accept you. And she says, excellent, I'm broke. I need financial aid. And they say, great, just bring us in your tax returns. Of course, Michelle's never had a job. So she has no tax returns. So she says, yeah, I don't, I don't have any tax returns. I live with my, my husband and my two, I mean, my uh, boyfriend and my two kids. And they're like, well, you're 19, bring us your parents' tax returns. And she says, I don't, my parents haven't claimed me in like three years. I've been raising my my little kids. And they're like, well, bring us your husband's tax returns then. And she says, I'm not married. And they say, well, you better get married then. So this system of bureaucracy embeds her further with a man that we now know she is actively trying to leave. She does. She goes and gets married. That week, she marries Rocky at a justice of the peace. They have a cake and that's that. And she goes to Montana State University. She gets the, the financial aid. Michelle is growing up. She's 19, 20, 21 years old. She's um, you know studying nursing. Rocky drives her to class, waits for her there, picks her up from class, right? Sometimes people think this is a romantic gesture. Of course, those of us in this Zoom right now, we know that this is stalking. So she is not allowed to have friends over even for studying. And she's not allowed to join a study group at work and in fact, at school, sorry. And in fact, what she does is she embeds an extra class class into her load. So Rocky thinks she's taking, I don't know, five instead of four. And that's how she forms a study group. She's incredibly smart. We also know that Rocky during this time says to her, look, I don't think your family likes me. I don't want to spend holidays with your family anymore. I want to spend holidays with my family. And you know, he's not, he's not wrong. Her family doesn't like him because they see how much he's controlling her. He doesn't want her to wear makeup. He doesn't want her to wear mini skirts. And again, he doesn't demand this of her. What he says is, oh, sweetheart, I see the way other men look at you when you wear mini skirts. I think that 
for your own safety, you should like wear bigger clothing, right? Or you shouldn't wear makeup like that that draws so much attention to yourself. So he couches this as like, I am protecting you. So when she's about 21, 22, 22, I think, Michelle uh, goes to her mother's house one day and says, I think Rocky's having an affair. And I want you to take me to a doctor and get checked for an STD. And one of the kind of uh, adorable things about Michelle that her mother told me is that she's hypochondriac. <laughs> and so her mother's like, none of us believed that Rocky was having an affair. But we humored Michelle and we took her to the Minute Clinic. And at that Minute Clinic, whoever saw her, I don't know if it was a nurse practitioner or a doctor, but whoever saw Michelle, of course, she did not have an STD, um, but they were concerned enough to issue her on the spot antidepressants. They'd never seen her before. They didn't know her history, but they were concerned enough to give her antidepressants, not concerned enough to issue any kind of like warning about her potentially harming herself, but antidepressants. Rocky, of course, finds them some time later and says, I'm not going to have a crazy wife on my hands. And he throws them away. So several months go by. Michelle pulls up at her mother's house. And now she's got the two kids. And she goes to her mom. Her younger sister, Melanie, is also there. And at this point, Melanie is six or seven months pregnant. And Michelle says to her mom, whatever happens, I'm going home to confront Rocky about the affair. Do not let him have these kids. This is such an important moment because Michelle knows something that her mother doesn't, although I'm not sure Michelle would have articulated it. And that is that Michelle telling her mother, do not let him have these kids is an indication that those kids have been used by Rocky to control Michelle, right? He takes the kids and we, we find out much later that he would take the kids camping or he would take them to a motel for the night if he was mad at Michelle and threaten threaten her with taking them all together if you ever leave me I'll get custody of the kids and she heard that she knew that and she wasn't wrong to suspect that he would have gotten custody because as it turns out in research by Joan Myers at GW in civil court, in divorce, divorce court, 25% of the time that women allege domestic violence, they lose custody altogether. 25% of the time. Somehow women like Michelle know this, right? And they take that threat seriously. So Michelle gives the kids to her mom and says, do not let him have the, the kids. I'm going home to confront Rocky. About an hour goes by and Michelle's mother sees Rocky pull up and she sees a look on his face that is absolutely terrifying. Like she's never seen this sort of rage. And she runs and she locks the back door and she locks the front door, throws the kids on the couch. And she basically like throws her body on the, on the kids. Like she doesn't quite know what to do. And Melanie is there, the younger sister who's, you know, as I say, pregnant. And Rocky storms across the yard and they can hear him breaking the glass at the back door. He breaks in leaves blood all up and down the wall, injures his, his own arm here. And Melanie tries to stop him and he assaults her, leaves her bruised all up and down uh, one of her arms and grabs Christy like a sack of potatoes, throws her over his shoulder and he's out the door. Just 30 seconds and he's gone. And Michelle comes, you know, five seconds later. And for the first time, Michelle begins to tell Sally that he's beat her in front of the kids, that he beats her, uh, um, you know, even when the kids are asleep, that um, in recent <clears throat> in recent weeks, he's gone to the outskirts of Billings and he's brought home a rattlesnake, a rattlesnake that he keeps in a cage and tells her he's going to put it in bed with her if she tries to do anything to upset him. This is coercive control. Right. There's a reason that my book is called No Visible Bruises. So Michelle's mother finally convinces Michelle to call the police. She's never called the police before. The police come. They take a statement. They say to her, well, what do you want us to charge him with? It's his kid. It's his mother-in-law's house. It's family, you know. And Michelle and, and her mother are like, 
isn't this your job? Like, aren't you supposed to know what to charge him with? He gets charged with criminal mischief. Michelle goes to the DA's office. <clears throat> she files for a restraining order. She she writes out a whole affidavit. He's beat me, the snake, the whole thing. She She's issued a restraining order on the spot. She goes out that night with her sister. She's 23 years old. She's never been to a bar. She goes, she has one drink with her sister and her sister says to me, this is her older sister, I've never seen her laugh so hard. In all of her time with Rocky, I'd never seen her laugh so hard as that night at the bar. The next morning, Rocky comes in. He had been at a hotel with uh, Christy, comes up to his house. The police are there waiting for him. They arrest him. And uh, Michelle thinks she's going to get a court date. And that's that. Instead, about an hour after he's arrested, she gets a call from his mother. And his mother says, oh, my God, sweetheart, I am so sorry. I cannot believe what he has done this time. He has really gone too far. And she says, yeah, I know, I know. And Rocky's mother says, I've talked to him. He promises he's going to get help this time. He promises he's going to stay at his brother's house while he's getting help. He just wants to talk to you. We've bailed him out. He wants to meet you in the park. He bails out an hour after he's arrested, right? 500 bucks and he's out. He also, even though he has a restraining order against him, knows that he's not supposed to have any contact with Michelle. So he has his mother do it, which of course, those of us who are at all familiar know that this is breaking the restraining order, but Michelle doesn't know this. He should have been immediately rearrested. Instead, Michelle gets in her car, drives to the DA's office in a, in a heated huff, throws herself at the DA's desk essentially and says, I want you to drop all those charges. Leave my family alone. This is a private matter. Michelle recants everything. There is no snake. There is no, he's, ne he's never beat me. This is our life. This is our family. And the DA says, eh, what can I do? My best witness recanted and she tosses the charges. And Rocky has moved back in by that night. So for the next two months, Michelle talks to no one. Now we know what's happening during those two months is that she is negotiating for her life and the life of her children. How do we know this? Because she talks to no one. Because she is saying to Rocky, I'm so sorry that I, I I lost control or I allowed you to not have control over me when I called the police. That will never happen again. I'm really sorry. I will not do that. It's all my fault. Right? This is a domestic violence victim negotiating for her life because system after system after system has failed her. She talks to no one for two months. It's Thanksgiving week. No one's heard from Michelle. The Tuesday before Thanksgiving, uh, they had uh, plans to have her grandmother from, I think she was from Wyoming, <clears throat> had driven in. And they were all supposed to have dinner together. And Michelle and her kids and Rocky, none of them showed up. And so Michelle's older sister and her dad and mom went to the house. And there they found Michelle shot four times. And Christy shot once, and Kyle shot once, and Rocky shot himself. So what do we learn about this situation? We learn that just like any kind of plot, there is a cause and effect. Because Michelle has offered to get a job at Motel 6, Rocky freaks out on her. And she reaches out to an informal system, I'll call them, his family. They come, they make things safe, they disrupt that moment of violence, but she is still left with the message that he controls her, right? And so then she tries a different system. She goes to school and the school says, mm, yeah, we're going to embed you further with him. Banking systems do this, mortgages do this, right? Like all kinds of bureaucratic systems really embed us with our abusers. And we need to we need to have those systems work on out on 
their bureaucracies for domestic violence victims. Anyway, so she goes to school. Rocky allows this, but he follows her. He tracks her every move, right? She puts the house in her name. Rocky doesn't know this. So smart. And then Rocky, let's see what happens after that. She puts the house in her name. She's going to school. Oh, she goes and she gets an STD test, right? Accuses her, her, him of cheating on her. And he's, we don't exactly know his response, except that he said, you're not going to be on this medicine. This is not okay. She now tries her mother's house, another informal system. Well, her mother isn't able to keep her safe either. Her mother loses Christy, right? And so they call the police. Now here, she's done with the informal systems and she's going into the formal systems. And the police come and they say, what do you want us to charge him with? It's his kid, right? So that formal system is not working for her. They have one chance. So then she tries the DA. And the DA is like, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll do a restraining order. But neither law enforcement nor the DA hold Rocky. He's out in and out in an hour. And so what is the message again and again from the informal and the formal systems that Michelle gets? The message is we prioritize his freedom over your life and your safety. And that is the message that she gets because for two months she talks to nobody nobody. And she winds up dead anyway. Once I began to understand that this works the same way plot works in any movies or books that we see, I really began to understand domestic violence, especially in this escalation, right? All these different systems that are, that are failing her and each system has only one piece of the story. Michelle has the whole story, but nobody really knows to ask this bigger story. And every system only gets one shot, only one shot. The advocates I know, domestic violence advocacy across the country, when I say this, they nod. They often are familiar with the fact that they get one shot to make a victim safe, right? Rocky could have been charged instead of just criminal mischief. He could have been charged with unlawful entry, remaining unlawfully within the within the house, uh, the home, criminal mischief, vandalism, um, criminal endangerment for sure, which by the way is a felony in Montana and was then. Instead, all he gets is this criminal mischief misdemeanor. The the uh, DA could have done evidence-based uh, prosecution instead of relying on her witness. She could have interviewed Michelle's mother. She could have interviewed Rocky's parents, right? She could have interviewed the neighbors. She could have interviewed Michelle's sister, who was also assaulted by Rocky. She could have sent a police officer out to the house to get material evidence of that snake, that that snake, ex snake existed. She also could have interviewed neighbors. Hey, have you ever heard yelling? Instead, she's overworked. She has too many cases. She does none of that. She says, well, she's recanting and she throws it away. And I'll tell you what, I interviewed that DA when I was writing No Visible Bruises. So it had been 15 years or something since Michelle's death. And that DA, who was no longer a DA, said to me, you know, I wouldn't do anything different today. And that is what we're up against. That is why I feel like I really, in, in when I give these talks, it's important for me to point out the places where I was ignorant and the places where I, where I can learn from others. The DA knew she was lying, but you know, she, she was overworked. She had too many cases. So Michelle is left with system after system that are giving, that, that give her the message that she's on the, on her own for what I call formal systems, education, healthcare, law enforcement, and the judiciary. That's another thing the, the, the DA could have done is go and talk to that doctor. So today in Montana, there are two changes. I'll be wrapping up here. There are two changes um, that are actually three changes that are pretty significant that they did in the wake of Michelle's death. One is the Billings Police Department now has a dedicated domestic violence officer. Um, who contacts every domestic violence victim, you know, after the, after an abuser has been arrested. So that's that's a really important step. There's also um, something called the Hope Card. 
in for a restraining order now instead of it being written on a piece of paper that can you know get lipstick on it and you know paper clips holes through it and whatever else we all carry in our purses you get it on what looks like a driver's license it's laminated it has a picture of the abuser the exclusion areas the dates if dates are relevant i know like in places like new jersey restraining orders never expire kind of cool mm. And victims can get as many of those cards as they want. So they can pass them out at their kid's school. They can pass them out at their at their place of work. They can pass them out to their families or their neighbors. Because here's another little detail that we know. The night Michelle and her kids were killed, a neighbor saw Rocky peering in his own windows of his house. And that was weird. The neighbor said, that's so weird. Why is he looking in the windows of his own house? If that neighbor had had a hope card, they would know, oh my gosh, he's not supposed to be there. That's why he's looking in the windows. I'm going to call the police. The last thing that, that they've changed in Montana is that if someone is arrested for domestic violence, they are held for a minimum period of time. I don't know if it's three hours, four hours. Um, I know like in New Jersey, I just spoke there this week, it's 24 hours. But that time, even three hours or four hours gives a domestic violence advocate enough time to get to a victim to say, okay, let's do a danger assessment on you and see of these 20 behaviors, how much danger are you in? Victims know that they're in danger and they know when something changes and they fear for their lives. What they don't know is that it can actually be quantified and scored. And some of the things they suspect are in fact signs of dangerousness, right? Strangulation is in fact more dangerous than a kick. So they can do a danger assessment. They can pack them up and get them to shelter. They could, in Michelle's case, since the house was in her name, they could have changed the locks or installed security cameras. So even just holding someone for a few extra hours gives a victim enough time to make some crucial, critical changes. <clears throat> Domestic violence is now the lens that I view the social issues we face as a country. It didn't used to be. But now it is my view. You know, the public consequences of domestic violence are vast. It is the leading cause of homelessness for women in this country. 92% of incarcerated women have domestic violence contributing to their incarceration. And for men, by the way, that's 80%. It intersects almost every mass shooting we have in this country. It is, of course, an indicator of mental health, gender equality, right? It costs employers and taxpayers billions of dollars every year in lost wages and incarceration and court fees and healthcare costs and law enforcement. I spoke Tuesday, no, Wednesday night this week at a private corporation in, in New Jersey, Paramus, Paramus, New Jersey. It's one of the few times I'd ever been hired to speak by a private corporation. We need to work with our local corporations to say it is in your best interest to be part of this, to have your HR managers trained by domestic violence advocates, to have people feel like they are in a safe working environment, right? To know if their employees are getting stalked. Um, you know, before the pandemic, 137 William, women around the world were killed every day. And those are only the ones we know for domestic violence. There's things like poisoning, car accidents, you know, falling off high spaces that are not, that are homicides, that are not classified as homicides. And that number has only gone up. So when I'm here today talking about domestic violence, I'm actually talking about homelessness and mass shootings and mass incarceration and trafficking and sexual assault and teen dating violence. I'm actually talking about every story that we're facing in a broken world. I'm going to leave you with this. People ask, what can we do? What can we do? And what I say is, think about the systems that you are involved in, both informal and formal, right? We're all members of a family. We're all members of our community. Maybe we're members of a church. Maybe we're members of a book club. Hopefully we're all members of book clubs. Um, maybe we're in law enforcement. Maybe we're attorneys and we're in those more formal systems. Maybe we're HR. Maybe we're social workers at, at the high school. And say, okay, I'm in these systems. How much do the other people in my systems know? Where can I intersect? How can I get 
resources, local resources to educate the people in these formal and informal systems, because this is a problem for all of us, right? You're talking about social issues and, and the things, crime issues in this broken world. All of us have a responsibility to fix it. And my book really is an attempt to change and correct that system because we need to know what victims like Michelle can't say and what they may not know they know. It is up to us to understand this context. Thank you. I'll I'll take questions now, I guess. <laughs> Rachel, thank you so much for that very painfully um, presentation. It was really hard hearing Michelle and, and her story. Um, we have a lot of questions in our chat, so I'll go ahead and jump into that. Um, one person asks, I would be interested in hearing you address how domestic violence repeats itself in generations. Why does this happen and what can we do to break the cycle? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I, you know, I probably only have a piece of the answer. And so I, I would also ask you to par participate uh, where I where, and fill in my blanks. But one thing I'll say is that in this country right now, there are at least 18 states that do not have mandated sex education in schools. No, I mean, none. And of the 18, there are about six that are opt in only, meaning that the parent has to opt in for their child, for their teenager or whomever. And those six, every single one of them are, uh, uh, what's the what's the um to avoid sex until you're married what's the word start to see oh my brain is like over 50 now so i'm yeah, that's abstinence. Abstinence. abstinence abstinence oh yeah starts with a that's what i meant sorry why did i think c consent starts with c abstinence starts with a okay anyway <laughs> welcome to my world yeah, they're all six of them are abstinence only. So I'm I'm a professor at American, as I said, I'm getting um, students, 18 year old, 19 year old students who have never learned about consent, who don't know the real definition of stalking. What they know is pop culture's definition of stalking. So when you see, you know, the Twilight movies and you see Robert Pattinson's character, vampire character leaning over Kristen Stewart in a movie while she's sleeping, that the pulp culture messaging of that is this is romantic. In fact, those of us on this call know or this Zoom know that that is stalking, right? So these kids are not getting any from these states anyway, they're not getting any countering of this message. So I think that's one huge problem that we have. Um, and I think we need to include teen dating violence. I think there's all kinds of things that we are not really doing. We do have a teen dating violence hotline in this country, but it is not well known. And I don't even remember it off the top of my head. I just know that we have one. Um, we don't have a violence prevention hotline. I did a story for the New York Times in, I can't remember when, maybe 2022 or 2021. You can just Google my name. It's called something like, I don't want to hit my children or something. I, I don't title my own uh, newspaper or magazine pieces. So it's a terrible title, but, um, and it's about a, an anti-violence hotline in the UK where abusers who are just about to lose their shit, excuse me, can call. Now this isn't going to make somebody not be abusive, right? It's a hotline. So it's disrupting a moment of violence, but I listened in on this hotline for about four months and these calls were incredible. They're all anonymous. And what you find are, it's about 85% men who call. What you find is that these men are um, vulnerable, that they also probably have abuse in their background as children. And one of the more effective things I found with these calls is the, the operators, they're not called operators, but the client, you know, the, 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 the operators who answer the calls are trained social workers and, and whatnot. And they never hang up a call without a list of actionable items by the call that the caller is meant to do. So for example, they get off the phone going, okay, I have to call my doctor and make an appointment and maybe consider antidepressants. Okay. I have to call, you know, a therapist. Okay. Um, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to, um, you know, get some help in this area or that area. And the other thing they do that's so critical, I think is 
the operators reframe the idea of leaving. So we all know, or maybe we don't, maybe some of us don't know, one of the most dangerous times for any victim uh, is when they try to leave, right? And that danger stays pretty high for about a year. There's data on, on you know, when, when, how much time you need for the danger to kind of come down. And what the operators say to the men, right? Because they're often, there were many calls where like a man would come home and his kids and his wife would be gone off to shelter, right? And he wouldn't know where they were and he'd be freaked out and he'd be like, you know, what's happening? And what the operator says is, listen, what she's doing is giving you an opportunity for just like a little timeout. It's just a timeout. And it's this really interesting reframing. Um, the other thing I'll say is Wednesday, when I went to this, when I was, I mentioned this corporate, um, this company that that uh, had hired me to come speak, I had more men uh, at that event. I probably had, there were probably 200 people there. And it was, pro I'm guessing anecdotally here, it was probably 75% men. I have never in four years, 65 keynotes in front of 20,000 people. That's how much talking I've done since No Visible Bruises came out. I have never had that many men in an in, in an audience before. And I said that I said this to them and I said it is up to you to reach out to other men. Other men aren't going to listen to me. It is your responsibility. And then okay, I'll just share this with you really funny. And then they all started clapping and I said, "Okay, men, you showed up here. You don't get applause for just showing up, right? You got to go on from here." <laughs> <laughs> the feminist in me wasn't going to let that opportunity for a joke go. But, you know, I think I, I really think that we it, it convinced me that we need to be reaching out to corporate partners far more than we're doing. They have resources for starters, but this contributes to their bottom line. Um, and uh, a lot of employers don't know, for example, that that it is. I think generally it might be federal law. I'm not sure. Some I have to look this up, but. It's a law in most states that domestic violence victims get time off for things like court dates and and you know with, with domestic violence. So, um, so I think those are some of the ideas for for breaking generational violence. But we need to normalize allowing abusers to talk about this too, because they're not happy being abusers. They're not happy living with their family afraid of them, right? It's like AA. It has to be. We have to couch it as like you too are going to have a better life if your children and your and your partner are not scared of you. And if they get that, then there's hope that they can change. Right. Thank you. Uh, another question is: Is there more domestic violence in impoverished areas, or is this just a myth? It's a it's a myth. In fact, it's one of the myths that I had listed in my um in my the beginning of my talk but I was like kind of worried that I was going to talk too much. I come from a family of salesmen so if if you don't stop us we'll just keep going and going and going. Um it is a myth. What what you find is that um poor communities reach out more. Um and they don't necessarily I mean black communities for example are they tend to not reach out as much because they are they're victimized by police, right? So a a, a female a uh, black domestic violence victim will often say, I don't want to call the police on him because the police already are, you know, um, not, not part of my, my culture in terms of helping us. They've always been a problem. So you find what you find is certain groups are more likely to call the police, but, you know, you see it in, in middle class and upper class every bit as much as you see it in lower class. What you find in the research, the 20 risk indicators that I mentioned, you find that unemployment is a stressor, but not a cause. So if somebody is constantly unemployed as Rocky was, it stresses him, right? It stresses the situation, but he already has the behavior, the, the violent behavior. Thank you. And then we have another question. Do you have data on youth in the foster care system and the likelihood of being in an abusive relationship? I don't have that data, but I know that that data exists. And I'll t I can give you a really good book. In fact, you may want to have this author come someday is, um, and I was on a, 
I was in a small group of judges that awarded her book a prize. So I, I'm, I'm really supportive of this book, but Roxana Asgarian, uh, A-S-G-A-R-I-A-N. She wrote a book um, about, I'm sure many of us would recall, this is going back now five or seven years. There were two white women, lesbian women who had adopted six children from foster care and they were huge on social media and it was all like, you know, one love and all this kind of stuff. And they drove over a cliff in California with the six kids and killed all, all eight of them, the two parents and the kids. And three of those kids were siblings and Roxana, who lives in Texas, where the kids were originally from, um, tracked down the, the family members of those three. And it turned out they had another, they had a fourth brother, an older brother who was too old to be adopted out of the foster care system. Um, and he didn't even know that his siblings had died. Roxana, this reporter, is the one who told him when she tracked him down. But that book has all kinds of data that is, in fact, national and has she's she's really on top of that issue. So a big recommendation to her. All right, thank you. I think we can slip in one more question. Um, are medical personnel trained in recognizing domestic violence? Yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> um, yes and no is the answer. I mean, there's a lot of good um, medical, pro there's a lot of good programming in medical offices, whether it's a, whether it's private or like the ER. Um, I know, for example, the Dove system in Dove, I think it's called Dove Inc. in Baltimore. Um, in Maryland uh, has has some new, uh, yes, we were once a family. Thank you for that. Yes, that's the name of the book by Roxana. Um, the Dove program in Maryland has uh, really good um, programming to try to address domestic violence um, in ERs and in doctor's offices. I know every time I go to a doctor's office and I'm asked, like, are you and are you safe at home? I'm like, well, I have a puppy and my daughter. So pretty safe, although my puppy does sometimes, you know, jump up and bite. <laughs> so but I'm always really grateful for that. But I really think that the um, I think the training is imbalanced across the country. I, just, I gave a talk in Hawaii, like right before the pandemic started. And, and I mean, like days before, like everything shut down. And there was a like head honcho of Kaiser there. And I, I confronted him in a kind of, in my nice jokey way <laughs> and said, can I have your assurance that you, you're going to bring this back to whoever is in charge of your ERs so that at Kaiser domestic violence victims, when they go to an ER will have best practices. And one of those best practices is to make sure that they separate out whoever has brought the person in the victim in, Right no matter because you know the thing is we have to open up our our minds to the fact that like abuse might come from a brother it might come from from i mean a child I, I have to say this is controversial but a teenage kid can be an abuser right i mean we have to think that anybody could be a victim anybody could be an abuser so we need to separate out the the two parties and create a safe space but i know it's it's it, i know medical personnel are really really stressed in terms of the time they get to spend with each patient. I will also say this, um, HHS, the Department of Health and Human Services, has um, uh, a new domestic violence, I can't remember of her, her exact title, but they are looking at this issue around Medicare and Medicaid, and um, especially around elder care and things like that. And they are looking for ideas and um, programs that work. And I do have direct links to them. So if someone has a great program they want to recommend, by all means, get in touch with me at American University. My email is just my last name, Snyder at American.edu. <laughs> it's the easiest email in the world. Rachel, thank you so much. This was just enlightening. I learned a lot just that I wasn't aware of. And I'm really looking forward to our next discussion to talk about local resources. Any last words, any anything that you would like to leave us with before we say goodbye? Well, I want to thank you all for your commitment to this. And um, I yes, I'll leave you with my favorite quote by Gandhi. He says, in a gentle way, you can shake the world.
I mm. love I love that quote. Thank you all so much. And um, I'll be back in the D.C. area in two days. So <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, safe travels. Thank you Thank so you. much, Rachel. OK, bye bye. <laughs> All right, everyone, don't leave. We're not done yet. So we have another 30 minutes. Um, we're going to learn about the local resources available to those experiencing domestic violence. We have Joe Meyer, the executive director and CEO of Shelter House, and Tony Zollicoffer, the division director of domestic and sexual violence services. They will each speak for about 10 minutes, followed by a 10 minute Q&A. And then a uh, shelter house will host a raffle for Ms. Snyder's book, No Visible Bruises. They have purchased 10 copies that we will raffle off to 10 um, lucky winners. So Joe, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Renee. Um, and uh, thank you all for um, attending today. It just shows that uh, we do have a community that really cares about uh, the people in need. Um, that are that are coming to us and reaching out to us um, and this issue of domestic and sexual violence that 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 we have. Um, as Renee mentioned, my name is Joe Meyer and uh, I'm, I'm the executive director and CEO for Shelter House, which is a local nonprofit uh, in Fairfax and Loudoun County serving uh, people experiencing homelessness and victims of domestic violence. And I also want to recognize uh, Nerjan Amendova, Therese Molina and Linda uh, Kimball, who are on the line with us too, who are my colleagues uh, working uh, within the same mission, and Nancy Soccer, uh, who is one of our board members uh, on, on Shelter House, providing great leadership um, towards our mission. So thank you all for coming too. Uh, I just want to take uh, three minutes to just give everyone uh, a, a brief overview of who Shelter House is. If you haven't heard of us, uh, what we do, um, how we respond to homelessness and domestic violence, and then the next uh, five five to seven minutes, we can talk specifically about Artemis House, which is our domestic violence shelter in Fairfax County. Uh, shelter House, uh, uh, as I mentioned, is a private nonprofit who contracts with local governments, uh, in this instance, Fairfax County and Loudoun Counties, to operate multiple shelters in the community. Uh, we have uh, four shelters in uh, Fairfax County. We have two for people, uh, families experiencing homelessness. Uh, we have one in Falls Church. We also have one, I'm gonna share my screen. We also have one in Fairfax um, that is called the uh, Kate Hanley Shelter. So I'm gonna share my screen here real quick um, so that you all can see the resources that we have uh, with us. Okay, everyone should be able to see that now. Um, so this is off of our website. Uh, as you can see, our Catherine K. Hanley Family Shelter uh, is located in Fairfax. Our Patrick Henry Family Shelter is located off Patrick Henry Drive, which is in Falls Church and in our Loudoun Homeless Services Center. If anyone has any uh, connections out in Loudoun County, lives, works out in Loudoun County, uh, that's how you access services there. Um, the history of Shelter House, we were created over 40 years ago. Uh, we were created, um, and I'll get to Artemis House in a second, uh, we were created by uh, a small group of people who were responding to people on the streets. Um, and they were giving them necessity items such as food, clothing out of the trunks of their cars, the basements of their houses. Um, and it was in 1983 uh, when a gentleman died of hypothermia in Fairfax County, uh, right there in the Calmore and the Falls Church area. And at that time, that group of individuals, along with other community members, went to Fairfax County Board of Supervisors um, and basically demanded that there be shelters in Fairfax County for people experiencing homelessness. Um, in 1985 is when the shelters were stood up, and that's our longest uh, standing shelter, a Patrick Henry Family Shelter, which is about a 45-bed facility for families experiencing homelessness. The Kate Hanley Shelter was built from the ground up by Fairfax County government. That's a 65-bed facility for families experiencing homelessness. And then Loudoun Homeless Services Center, which we just took over the contract for in 2022, um, has been in Loudoun County for, for many years, um, but Shelter House just, just took over the contract to operate that one. Why do I mention these shelters when we're talking about domestic violence? Um, as we just heard um, by Ms. Snyder is that um, there is a very clear intersection between homelessness and domestic violence. 
the majority of the people that we are seeing in our family shelters are single women with children with some type of domestic violence background, whether it be mental abuse, whether it be physical abuse, whether it be child witness to abuse. It was in 2010 when Shelter House um, and other key partners of ours um, started to really look at the causes of homelessness and uh, where the intersections were. Of course, there's mental health, there's alcohol and drug and substance abuse, there's loss of jobs, um, there's there there's a lot of different causes um, why people experience homelessness, but the one that we saw that was very clear, especially in the homeless in the uh, family shelters, was domestic and sexual assault. From 2009 and 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 uh, prior to that, Fairfax County government was operating what they called the women's shelter, which is now called Artemis House. It was a county run program. And through advocacy of the community, uh, we were able to um, uh, talk to the county and the county agreed that they should contract also this particular shelter out to a nonprofit um, because we can do things that county government employees cannot do, which is lobby, talk to the board of supervisors to give us more money, uh, fundraise, uh, gather those volunteers to come in. Um, uh, um, in, in kind, uh, fundraisers, a lot of different things, uh, that we can do. And also we can do it just a little bit more efficiently than, than County government can. So in 2010, um, is when shelter house took over the contract to operate Artemis house. Artemis house is the only 24 seven domestic violence facility in Fairfax County. There's approximately 90 beds that we have across the county for people experiencing, people fleeing domestic violence and sexual assault and human trafficking. So just to put that into perspective a little bit, we have in Fairfax County about 1.4, 1.5 million people that live in Fairfax County. There's a statistic out there that it's about one in four women experience domestic violence in their lifetime. One in eight men experience domestic violence in their lifetime. However, fewer of them come forward than, than uh, women. So if you do the math a little bit, as far as the population that we have in our community, and we have 90 beds in our entire continuum to respond to people fleeing domestic and sexual violence, there's not nearly enough space or beds in order to resolve the issue and respond appropriately to victims of domestic violence. So how do we operate? We have a hotline, as you can see, um, and uh, um, Tony will talk about the hotline that DSVS has in a minute. Um, this phone number that you see on the screen right now, the 703-435-4940 number, is one of the hotlines in Fairfax County that particular number rings straight to the shelter. In all of the other programs that you see from the Kate Hanley shelter on over um, to your right, um, you have to go through some type of system in order to get into those shelters. Artemis House and the domestic violence shelter, you do not. So if you yourself are experiencing domestic violence or know somebody that is experiencing domestic violence, that number that you see right there, the 435-4940 number, is a number that is 24 seven. If you think somebody needs help, you can call that number. Somebody will answer the phone when you call that number. We always encourage people to call 911 if they are in imminent danger and they need police response. Um, we ask that you call 911 first, but that number right there is how you access services for Artemis House, which is our domestic violence shelter. Also, to put things into perspective a little bit, and I'm not saying this to, to, to deter anyone from calling that number, because if you have any questions whatsoever or you think you need shelter, you can pick up the phone and call that number. But because and why, why I felt it was important to share the numbers as far as how many people experience domestic violence and the number of beds that we have right now to respond to victims of domestic violence, um, it's because we are, uh, you know, there, there, we, we consider there to be a certain criteria in order to get into the domestic violence shelter, just because we don't have enough. 
And the threshold is um, determined through an imminent danger um, uh, screening that we do. So anyone that meets the threshold of imminent danger, which means you are actively fleeing your abuser, will be able to get into shelter. Somebody that has domestic violence previously that just needs help or support, our partners at uh, Fairfax County, the Domestic and Sexual Violence Services, do a fantastic job with making sure that everyone is served in our county that has experienced and experiencing domestic violence that doesn't meet the threshold of needing shelter and a safe place to stay. You can also see on all, all of the, uh, the, the three other programs that Shelter House operates, there's physical addresses at those particular shelters. Um, our domestic violence shelter is in an undisclosed location. So all 90 beds are in an undisclosed location because we need to keep people safe and make sure, because as you heard from Ms. Snyder, the first year of somebody leaving their abuser is most of the time the most dangerous. So we have to make sure that we are keeping people safe in our shelters. Um, so I, I'm going to leave it there because I know that we, we are on a, um, uh, time, time frame here. I'm going to stop sharing and just pull up one more uh, for you to look at that if you want to get involved in Shelter House. Um, that's how you access our services. Um, if you want to get involved in Shelter House, let me see if I can figure out how to do this one. Um, I may not be able to. Um, yep, there it is. Uh, this is how, along with our website, um, the shelterhouse.org, um, you can also email at info at shelterhouse.org. There's also one of those Q, Q codes there that'll take you straight to our website. We have a lot of ways to get involved. As I said, we're a uh, private nonprofit, so we can do fundraising. We can bring the volunteers in to do certain things. Um, I really encourage you to visit our website, click on the get involved tab. And there are three key ways to get involved. And that is volunteer your time. That is volunteer from an in-kind standpoint. We have a great um, system online uh, through Amazon Wishlist. I think that's still up there um, where you can click in the, uh, um, all of the things that we are in need of right now are updated regularly um, on our Amazon Wishlist right there on, on, um, on our website. And then the last way is to contribute financially. As I mentioned, um, we contract with our local governments and they do a fantastic job and they are great partners of all the nonprofits, especially in Fairfax County. So they do a fantastic job and our board of supervisors and our leadership do a fantastic job of making sure that we're taking human services um, very seriously and we're making sure that victims um, are removed, um, the ones that do want to leave um, are, are removed and have a safe place to stay, but we still need more. We don't nearly have enough beds in our community to respond to the full effect of domestic violence and sexual assault in our community. So every dollar raised, we're having a wonderful golf tournament coming up next week. It's on Friday. It's going to be a bull run. I think there's still slots open. Um, and uh, that we raise about eighty dollars to $90,000 at that event that goes straight towards our um, Artemis House and our domestic violence programs. Um, so there are a lot of different ways. Please look at our website. Um, and, um, you know, we, we welcome any questions at the end um, with, uh, and, you know, with the, with the services that we provide too. So uh, again, Renee, thank you for the opportunity. And um, we will take questions at the end after, uh, after Tony goes. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Joe. So Tony, I will pass it over to you. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you. First of all, I want to thank uh, Joe Myers and Shelter House, amazing partners um, with Fairfax County and Domestic and Sexual Violence Services. Thank you, Renee, for, for putting a, a wonderful um, uh, presentation together. Um, I am Tony Zollicoffer, and I'm the Division Director for Domestic and Sexual Violence Services, which is Fairfax County's um, or organization responsible for um, intervention, prevention, 
of domestic violence, sexual violence, human trafficking, and stalking. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit sort of overall about the uh, four public uh, facing programs that DSVS has, and then going to turn it over to my colleague, Vanessa, who's going to talk specifically around one of our programs, our advocacy program. Um, I want to acknowledge there's a couple of people in the room that uh, I saw come through. We have our program manager, um, Lydia Gerges, um, who I saw in the Zoom call. So welcome, Lydia. And I also see one of our board members for uh, the Commission for Women, Anjali Ramsey, I believe is here. So um, thank you guys for coming and supporting us. And so um, DSVS, that we're Domestic and Sexual Violence Services, if you're in government, you know you have to have an acronym, otherwise, like you're not a real government employee. So <laughs> DSVS, we um, have four what we call public facing programs. Um, advocacy services, um, again, Vanessa Collars is gonna talk a little bit more in the moment about that, but provides court accompaniment, safety planning, um, case management and connection to other services and resources, and is also sort of that primary liaison for Artemis House. We also have our clinical services, um, and in cl through clinical services, we provide individual and group counseling to adults, teens, and children who are experiencing interpersonal violence, and we also have programming for those who are responsible for causing harm. We are one of few um, organizations in Fairfax County that actually has a response to those who are causing harm. We're very, very excited about um, ramping up that program as well to have some community-based accountability measures. Um, in, in, because we know that if we are only responding um, to providing intervention and prevention around um, victim services, that we are not really addressing those who are causing harm. And so we've got to have both of those responses if we're trying to get upstream of that. So we're very excited about that program as well. We have our crisis um, response services, which provides 24 hour hotline for anyone that needs support navigating interpersonal violence, um, persons who are experiencing violence, family members, friends, professionals, and others who need help and support. Um, can call that 24-hour hotline. I'm going to put that up in, in a minute. Um, and then this program where Ms. Snyder talked about a lot um, is called the Lethality Assessment Program, which really talks about those high indicators. And it's a partnership that we have with law enforcement to identify and support persons at highest need um, and highest danger of being seriously harmed or murdered by their partner. It's a wonderful program that we have um, in connection with our law enforcement partners. Um, we have um, prevention, education, coordination, and training, and that is our education arm of the division. And we have volunteer services, which is you know a, a way to get involved in all parts of the division, and we're always looking for for volunteers to assist us in that. Um, and then we are also the liaison for the county's commission for women. And, um, and so DSVS, and I'm going to actually share my screen and just sort of show um, a, a bit of statistics for you and, um, and our 24 how a lot line, and then I will just pass it on. So give me a second to share my screen. Um, so this is, again, uh, DSBS programs in a, in a nutshell, and we talked through those. Um, just a little bit of context about some of the community measures that we see. Um, last year, in FY23, which ended at the end of June of, of 2023, we had almost 2,000 hotline calls, um, um, a little bit more than 350 lab calls. Um, we saw over 1,000 advocacy clients and provided over 3,000 counseling sessions for um, victims and survivors of domestic violence, as well as those who cause harm. Um, a bit of like sort of the community measures, which I think can put this in context. The law enforcement responded to um, almost 38,000 domestic violence calls last year. 
and there was a 51% increase in arrest charges due to strangulation um, up to 253. And as, as Ms. Snyder mentioned, strangulation is a high indicator of lethality. And so this we will, I think we'll make these slides available if you are in need and you want access um, to any domestic violence services, um, our 24 hour hotline is available 703-360-7273. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Vanessa Cullors who's just gonna talk a little bit in depth about our advocacy services, which is the hub really for a lot of support services that are available um, for persons experiencing interpersonal violence. Thank you so much, Tony. I'm so happy to be here this afternoon with all of you. Just to tell you a little bit more about our advocacy services program. Um, our advocates provide client-centered services where we really walk alongside folks who have experienced domestic violence, sexual violence, stalking, or human sex trafficking. We assist with safety planning and connection to resources that can be helpful um, to individuals along their journey. Advocacy Services operates within a DVAC partnership, the Domestic Violence Action Center, which consists of 16 county and nonprofit partners that work together to provide services for those impacted by violence in our community. We work closely with our partners at Shelter House to assist individuals accessing prevention services as well as emergency shelter. We collaborate with the Tahare Justice Center, Ashiana, and the Multicultural Clinical Center at Northern Virginia Family Service to provide culturally specific services, um, emergency shelter, legal services, including immigration legal services, housing and employment supports, counseling for adults and children individually, as well as in group settings, and safety planning are all services that the purple that people that we work with find helpful. We offer services in multiple locations, including our main hub at the historic courthouse. We provide advocacy services at the Juvenile Domestic Relations District Court, as well as General District Court. We also provide um, services at community sites, including Connections for Hope and the Herndon Neighborhood Resource Center, the Inova Women and Children's Center in Falls Church, the Lee Community Center, and also Tyson's Corner Center Community Resource Office. So we hope that if you or someone you know uh, may be impacted by domestic violence, sexual violence, stalking, or human trafficking, that you'll reach out to our advocacy services. We provide services um, daily, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, call us. We would be more than happy to talk with you about our services, assist with safety planning. And if you're calling for information for someone else, we'd be help, happy to help you get connected with some possible resources to then share with someone that, that you know or care about. Right. Thank you so much for those wonderful resources. Tony, I'm going to ask if you would please share that first slide. We had a um, attendee asking to sh um, for you to share it. And I will also email it to the people that registered for um, today's presentation. Um, we do have a few questions from our guest. Um, I think this probably could be for Joe or Tony. Um, someone saying, I can't get anyone to realize the severity of my situation because it's emotional, isolating, and very manipulative. So I'm only told that I'm being ridiculous because he is overly nice and giving. What can she do? Any suggestions? Tony, do you want to take that one first, please? Sure. Yes. So first of all, thank you for your bravery and actually putting out the needs that you have. I think it can be extremely isolating um, to struggle with something so hard and then reach out for help. And so to actually reach out is, is that first step in bravery. And so thank you for trusting this space for, for that. I. I think that if I were to sort of give any kind of um, advice or, or 
talk through it. I, I think I might suggest that you talk to an advocate, um, to someone who is professionally trained to sort of walk alongside you and help you decide what choices are best for you. I think that family, in my experience, tend to be very well-meaning. And I say this often, um, I mean, Vanessa's probably gonna roll her eyes because she's heard me say this a thousand times, that first responders are usually our family and friends, and they are the least equipped to actually respond well, usually. And so while family and friends um, mean well, typically some of what they provide is not all that helpful. And so I would encourage you to maybe give the gift to yourself of talking with someone who is trained, who is supportive, but who also takes your lead as the expert in your own situation and your own um what would make sense for you and then sort of decide through how you respond and how you move forward in making the decisions that are right for you and your family. That would be um, how I would respond. Um, and I hope that answered your question. She said, thank you so very much. Um, she said she's basically been in a bedroom for eight years. Um, Thank you for that, Tony. Um, we have another question from this person um, for you, Joe, about the beds that are available. Um, she said, is this only limited to people who live in Fairfax County? It is, unfortunately. Um, we only serve Fairfax County residents um, in, in our domestic violence shelters. Uh, however, you can call any of those numbers that either Tony um, provided or I provided um, and you will get resources to um, the community that, that you live in, um, the domestic violence services there. So they should be equipped to provide you with those resources. Thank you. And then we have another question. If I call a hotline and the screening deems I'm not in Im imminent danger, what's next for me? Yeah, so again, we will refer you. Um, there's... We, we will refer you to the appropriate service. Um, if someone is experiencing um, domestic violence but does not meet the threshold, unfortunately, but is going to be homeless, um, we do operate two other shelters for people and families experiencing homelessness. Uh, if you are a single individual, then we would provide you the number to a single shelter. Uh, the imminent risk is really determined that if you are at danger currently right now and your abuser is is or will be looking for you, um, then then um, you know that would that would deem you appropriate for for Artemis House and you know from the safety standpoint. Um, but the homeless stand, but but from a homeless standpoint, uh, you would be referred to one of the other homeless shelters if it's something where you don't need housing but you need the support services. Um, that's why it's so important and why uh, Shelter House and um, uh, DSVS are both on this call today, um, because we work very closely together um, to make sure that when people call um, either service or either department, um, that we have a very fluid um, uh, uh, handoff, so to speak, to make sure that uh, we're able to provide you the number of DSVS to get the the, the appropriate resources to you. Thank you. And just for yeah, and can I, can I just add oh, yeah. Renee really Absolutely. quickly to that that we also understand and 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 Artemis House understands this extremely well. Shelter House, Artemis House understands this extremely well that you know um, lethality and imminent danger is fluid, and so you know just understanding that perhaps at that moment there the the risk of imminent danger may be one way, but but if that danger changes, that, you know, Shelter House will not turn away any person who is in imminent danger of, of, of being um, harmed. And so just understanding that, that, you know, your situation changes 
if it changes, you can continue to call and, and seek support and, and shelter. So I, I just wanted to, to, you know, sort of make sure that that's clear as well. Thank you, Tony. Yes. Thank you. And then someone just wanted clarification. Um, the beds are available for residents who live in Fairfax County and Fairfax City or just the county? Uh, Fairfax County and all towns and cities within Fairfax County. So it includes Herndon, the town of Herndon, City of Fairfax, Falls Church, City of Fair Falls Church, Vienna. All, yes, all of those. And then I, I'll ask just one more question. Um, I would like to hear about organizations in the area that a domestic abuser could be directed once they get to the point where they admit a need to change or are forced where they can be helped with their criminal narcissistic problem. Yeah, so we touched a little bit on that. Um, DSVS, Domestic and Sexual Violence Services, has a program. It's called our ADAPT program. Um, and that is specifically for domestic violence intervention for those who cause others harm. There are um, three or four other organizations in Fairfax County that also provides that. Um, services are either mandatory if there is, you know, probation and parole is a part of, of their um, pr protective order, but there, it's also voluntary. So there, there are four wonderful programs in um, Fairfax County that provides services to those who cause harm. And um, and as as you as you know, we have been really trying to change our language a bit um, around, you know, sort of people first language because we the humanness of, of those who cause harm sometimes is what helps them to sort of take accountability and responsibility for their behavior. And so changing the language to people first language is also helpful in helping folks to start to take accountability and responsibility. So they're what we call compassionate accountability for your behavior so that people can change um, and have the best opportunities for that. All right, thank you so much, um, Joe, Tony, Vanessa for sharing the local resources. Um, I really appreciate hearing it as well as I'm sure our guests.